So um, today we will uh, continue on chapter seven, or actually we should now go back to the start of, of chapter seven, and then we'll uh, uh, explain how we can uh, find these uh, uh, types of, of uh, well data for uh, the lot sizing problem, which we last week saw different uh, uh, solution methods for. Uh, and as we remember, the lot sizing problem will uh, uh, be defined as uh, uh, having certain periods when you know the demand, but uh, the, the demand is not at a fixed rate, it will be at a different rate. So we will have different rate, uh, different demand for different uh, periods. Uh, and then the problem is to decide when to uh, start uh, uh, producing or, or producing your uh, uh, particular uh, product uh, because you sh should find the, the optimal uh, uh, periods to produce uh, and so some periods you need to produce and some periods you sh should just use uh, fro from the stock. So then you have uh, uh, the demand given for a certain number of, of periods uh, we looked at different heuristics first. We saw that silver meal heuristics, the silver meal, uh, which was to well, where we were aiming to find the, uh, the average or the um, the average cost per period when you looked at the setup cost and the holding cost. So we calculated the costs as the average of uh, a number of periods j, where you had the k, the setup cost, plus holding cost multiplied by the r, uh, no, not rj, but r2, uh, if we are now uh, st starting from period number one. So here we had the period number two which means that you were paying a uh, holding cost for one period for the demand in period number two. And then two multiplied by the holding cost multiplied by R3, which means that you have to pay holding cost for the demand in period number three to be stored from period one to period number three, which is two periods. And we can, could continue until uh, the uh, jth, or what you can say that j minus 1 multiplied by the holding cost multiplied by rj, which means that you have to pay holding cost for j minus 1 periods for the demand in period number j. And this should now be divided by the j, which is the number of, uh, of periods. So this is the silver meal method. We start with looking one period ahead, and then uh, we calculate the, the cost for one period. Then we go to the next, the number of periods, which is two. Find the average cost per period for, uh, for two periods, uh, and compare with the previous one. And if this is smaller than the previous one, we should continue. And then look at three periods ahead. Uh, and uh, compare the average cost with the previous one. And when the average cost will start to increase, then we should stop and we should conclude that we should use the previous number of, of periods to, uh, to produce for and then start a new production in the current period and start all over again. Uh, we also looked at uh, a method called the least unit cost which was quite similar, but instead of dividing by the number of periods, uh, we divided by the number of units. So if we change this to the least unit cost, uh, still we want to find the, the average or, or the, uh, uh, we need to include the setup cost and the holding cost for a given number of periods, but instead of dividing by the number of periods j, we should divide by the total number of units, which is r1 plus r2, and up to 
Rj. So this is the difference between the silver mill heuristic and the least unit cost heuristic. Uh, either divide by the number of periods or the total number of, uh, of units. But the principle is the same. Compare the costs for every number of periods increased by one each time, how many periods we should uh, produce for. And when the cost starts to increase, then we should stop and make a new production in that particular period. And then we will find a production plan which not necessarily is the optimal one, but usually it will be a good one. And it's not none of these heuristics which are the, the best, because in some uh, situations, silver meal can give you a good solution. In others, the least unit cost could give you a good solution. And we also looked at a third heuristic, the part period balancing, uh, which also tried to uh, find the holding cost for a number of periods ahead, but then we should try to, to choose the number of periods to produce for where the holding cost is as close as possible to the setup cost. So k okay, should be as close as possible to the sum of the holding cost, then multiplied by r, and then of course we need to also um, uh, also, also uh, <coughs> consider the number of periods to, uh, they are stored for. So we saw example on all these three uh, heuristics. And in addition, we looked at the LP problem, which is formulated for these ty such types of, uh, uh, of lot sizing problems. And uh, if we first look at this one, lot size. We uh, had the, the formulation, uh, which is shown here. <coughs> so in this case, we have 10 different uh, periods, and we have a setup cost of 132. Uh, and the deltas will decide which period we should uh, produce and which period we should not produce. Uh, and we have a holding cost of 0 0.6 for storing one unit of inventory in one period. So here the i's are the stock at the end of each period. And here we can see that the numbers in this column is the demand in the 10 different periods. And the x will then describe the production in each period. So the production minus the inventory in period number one should meet the demand. So you need to produce, and if you are only producing for one period, then there will be no inventory left. But if you are producing for two periods, you should produce 42 plus 42. And then for, uh, the first 42 are uh, used in period number one, and the next is, is used in period number two. And then you have to store 42 items in one uh, period. So this is the way uh, these balancing constraints uh, are working. You have to find the production which will meet the demand and the difference in production and demand will then be adjustment of the inventory. Uh, so we have a new uh, set of constraints here which says that the x1 to x10, the production quantity, should be less than or equal to 439. This number is a maximum number, which is actually the sum of all the 10, uh, the demand in the 10 uh, periods here. So the sum of these numbers are 431, which means that you should never produce more than 431. And the deltas are here defined to be binary variables, which means that they are either zero or one. If they are zero, there will be no production in that particular period. If they are one, there will be production. This means if the deltas are zero, the corresponding axis will be less than or equal to zero because, well, and then of course they will also be, uh, be zero. So there will be no production if you don't have a setup in one particular month. But if you have a setup, if the delta is one, then you can produce up to 439. Solving this problem, 
will give us this solution. And you can see that the objective value is here 610.2. You have the deltas shown here. One in period number one, one in period number six, and one in period number nine. And if you go further down, we can also see that the x's are shown here. x1 is equal to 154. This means you should produce 154 units in period number one. And then no production in period two, three, four, and five. And as we remember, in period number six, the delta was one. And then we have a new production batch here of 171 which will meet the demand in period 6, 7 and 8, and then a new production in period number 9. And we can also look here at the inventory level at the end of each uh, uh, period. So if you are producing 154 in period 1, we remember that the demand was 42, which means that you have 110, uh, 112 units left. And then no production in period number two. We have a demand of 42. And we can see that the inventory level in period number two is 42 less than in period one. So we are using from inventory to meet the demand in these periods. And then we also looked at one other example uh, of lingo code, which is shown here. Uh, this is uh, actually the same example, the same problem, same lot sizing problem, uh, which is uh, uh, described in another way in uh, lingo code. Uh, in real life, these types of problem might have uh, maybe thousands of different variables, thousands of different constraints. They can grow very huge, these types of, of LP problem. Uh, and then Lingo and other optimization software have a programming language to describe such uh, problems so you don't have to uh, you don't have to write directly every line and every uh, and every parameter in, in this uh, uh, in this problem so you can rather use a code like you can see here and in the curriculum in this course, which is important for you to know, you should be able to recognize such problem. You should be able to know that this or these types of uh, uh, these commands will describe the same problem as you have seen with the, uh, with the, the lot sizing problem. You should be able to understand it, but I don't expect that you, uh, well, you, you don't need to, to know how to do the exact advanced programming yourself. But you should know this example, and you should know that this is also uh, a way to, uh, to describe this uh, type of, of lot sizing problem. And of course, if you continue on uh, master studies, for example, then you also will be able to either use Lingo or Ample or uh, Ample Cplex or uh, uh, Express, or, and also uh, Excel has, uh, has one uh, solver included, which is uh, uh, solving these types of, of problems and, and can be able to solve uh, huge linear programming problems. Uh, but I will um, again go through this quite fast. Uh, as, uh, as mentioned, it's important that you can uh, know and explain these types of, uh, uh, of LP formulation and you should be able to recognize this uh, lot sizing problem from this code. So here we define that this is a model with the given sets. And here you define the set called TID, which means time in Norwegian, from 1 up to 10, which means that you define that you have 10 different periods. And here you define the parameters, the R, which is the demand. And you can see here in the data section, we will define the demand for the 10 periods, 42, 42, 32, 12, and so on, as we remember from the previous example. Uh, we have the case, which is the set of cost. They are also defined for 10 periods, even if they are the same. 132 is the set of cost in any period. Uh, we have the holding cost, 
which is defined as 0 0.6 for all 10 periods. And in this case, we don't uh, include the production costs, so they, they are set to be 0. But here, you could also include, if the production costs were, were, uh, were uh, considered to be relevant, you can also put in values for, for the production costs here. Uh, and so the decision variables will be the axis, which is the production, the i's, which is the size of the inventory, and the delta, which is the binary variable, which defines whether you will have production in one period or not. So here you define the sets, which is now defined to be uh, in uh, so-called arrays with 10 different values. You define the constant, which is shown here in the data uh, section, and also the decision variables, the production, inventory, and whether or not there should be a production. And then at the end of this file, you can see the exact program or the exact definition of the problem. We are minimizing the t cost function, which here is defined as the sum for all the 10 periods in TID. For k, the setup cost, multiplied by the deltas, the binary variables, plus the holding cost, which is 0 0.6, multiplied by i, which is the variable which describes the inventory level. And here, this part is not necessary in our example because the c's are defined to be zero. So they will always be zero. But if we should include the, uh, the cost of, of production, then this will also be, be relevant. So this is now the objective function, which corresponds to the first line in uh, the model here. So this minimization problem corresponds to this minimization problem. The t cost function is here defined to be the same as this, but here you are listing all the variables, and here you are writing a program uh, code which describes that uh, you should include all the variables, the deltas and the i's, and also eventually the, uh, the production cost. So if we now look at the next line, we can see the constraints. The x1 production in period 1 should be equal to the demand in period 1, and eventually you should also adjust with inventory here. Remaining what you are producing more than the demand will be stored as inventory. And then for all the others, since period number one here is, uh, is defined uh, explicit, you do not include period one here, but for all the other periods in TID, which means that you start on two, continue to period number 10, you should uh, have, well, uh, define constraints here as the production in one period plus the inventory in the previous period, T minus one, minus inventory in the current period should be equal to the demand in that period. And this is another way to define the constraint set shown here. You can recognize that the axis plus the previous inventories, x2 plus i1, minus the current inventory should meet the exact demand for, for that period. Uh, and if we now continue, we can also look at this constraint set here, which says that for all the periods in the TID array from 1 up to 10, all the axes should be less than or equal to this command here, which means that you are summing up the demand for all the periods. We remember that was 439 plus, now uh, multiplied by the deltas. This two commands here, the for loop and this command, will then correspond to the next constraint set, which is shown here. That the x1 
should be less than or equal to 439. 439 will then be the sum of all these, uh, no, not here, of course. Here. Uh, so this uh, uh, constraint set here, that the, the production will be less than or equal to the sum of the Rs for all the 10 periods multiplied by the delta in the corresponding period. And delta, as we remember, is a binary variable defined here to be binary, and then it means that it is either 0 or 1. It is 0 if you are not producing, and it is 1 if you are producing. So all these three constraint sets are in the previous file shown with 10 different lines, as we can see here. But here, in this program, they are shown with only one or eventually two lines. So this is another way to write uh, these types of, of problem, uh, problems in, in Lingo, uh, which, of course, when you have a huge number of, uh, uh, of constraints and variables, will be, uh, be much easier than to write thousands of, of different uh, lines. Solving this problem will give us exactly the same solution, 610.2. Uh, and we have the Rs here, of course. This, the Rs are the defined uh, demand. But if you look at the Xs and the Ys, uh, we can see that we have the same values here. And also the deltas. So as mentioned, uh, I don't expect you to, uh, to write your own problems, but you should be able to recognize these types of lot sizing problem, also written in uh, lingo code. Uh, and you should be able to, to recognize it and also to, to know that these are, uh, this code will, will represent these types of, of uh, linear <coughs> programming problems. Uh, okay, this was uh, last week's Lecture, so now I will continue on uh, chapter 7, uh, which is about the push and pull production control system. And uh, what we uh, presented last week was uh, the last part of this chapter, at least the last part we should, uh, should use in, uh, uh, in, in the curriculum in this course. But uh, we should also uh, include the introduction, which I will now uh, go back to because uh, this is a way to uh, to know how we can find these uh, uh, the data for these types of, of lot sizing problems. So now we will talk about this push and pull production control system, or we should talk mostly on the push control system because this is a course on mathematical uh, modeling, uh, or or. Uh, 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 well, models for, for these types of, of problems. So on the push production control system, we have, have more models, and the pull production control systems are actually more, uh, more theory, which you will learn in other courses. But here, let's go through the basic definition. The MRP, the material requirement planning, will then be the basic process of translating a production schedule for an end product, which is defined in the master production schedule, to a set of requirements for all the sub-assemblies and parts needed to make that item. Uh, well, products, many, most products, or at least many products, uh, they will consist of lots of different components and different sub-assemblies. Uh, and then we need to have a plan for production or purchasing all these types of, um, uh, of components which we need in our production. Uh, just in time is the, the other type of, um, of production uh, planning uh, system, uh, which is uh, derived from the original Japanese Kanban system, which is, was developed by the car producer Toyota. And this seeks to deliver the right amount of production at the right time. So this goal is to reduce work in process as much as possible to an absolute minimum. So you should have everything just at the time you need it. 
so um, RP is then the classical push system because you make a plan, you make a production schedule for all level based on the forecast of sales of end item. And when you have produced, the sub assemblies are pushed to the next level, whether they are needed or not, because you have a production plan and you are trying to follow that plan. Uh, while in the just-in-time, you have the classical pull system, that the basic mechanism is that the production at one level will only happen, you will only initiate a production when you have a request from a higher level. It means that uh, in Toyota, it starts with a customer uh, wanting, wanting to, to purchase uh, or ordering a car, and when Toyota knows that they need a car, then they send requests to all the, the, uh, all the uh, workstations or, or production uh, uh, places uh, earlier in the system, so they will always pull inventory and components from the previous, uh, previous workstation and, and the previous uh, vendor and, and delivery of, uh, uh, of components. So in MRP, you are making a plan and you are producing from that plan, but in just in time, you rather look at the orders and then you are, uh, of course, you have you have to organize a system, so it is uh, uh, straightforward that it should go as smoothly as possible to, to get components from, from the earlier level, but it's always here initiated by a request at a higher level. So these are two uh, opposite ways to, to plan. Uh, in some, uh, for some products, in some production system, uh, the MRP is the typical uh, system, which uh, where you need to organize production by um, uh, by uh, plants at a higher level. But in other uh, productions, you you might uh, better use a just-in-time system. Uh, of course, these are also extreme situations. So most production system will be somewhere between this. Uh, it's also of course always uh, uh, useful to try to, to reduce the stock as much as possible to use this just-in-time system uh, when you can use it, but also sometimes you will probably need to have a plants at the, at the higher levels. Uh, so as it's uh, written here, these methods offer two completely different approaches to basic production planning in manufacturing environment, and they have well advantages over the other. But as mentioned here, neither seems to be sufficient on its own. So you sometimes you need to have a more MRP-like system, and in other types you you might need to to be more uh, like a, a just-in-time system. Uh, but the main advantage of uh, MRP is it takes the forecast for the end product demand and in an environment with a substantial variation of sales then, and of course also that you have a good uh, forecasting method, uh, this will have a substantial uh, advantage because uh, like you see in, uh, so in the methods for, for lot sizing, when you have orders for different periods, which is uh, uh, <coughs> you know how much you need in the different periods, but they might differ very much from one period to the next. Then you can make plans by this MRP P system, and you can make these production plans as we have seen examples on, on methods how, how to solve. While on the just-in-time, it will reduce inventory to a minimum, and in addition to save direct inventory carrying cost, there are also substantial side benefits, such as improvement in quality and plant uh, efficiency when you are focusing on the, the just-in-time production plan. So neither of them will be uh, will replace uh, the other, but there are situations where uh, MRP will certainly be the best, and there are other situations where just-in-time will be, uh, well, you should at least aim to, to have a more just-in-time-like <coughs> like production. Uh, so, as mentioned, we will focus in this course on the, the MRP uh, basics. 
uh, because this is, uh, of course, where you learn uh, different models, and the just-in-time is more, um, well, not so many models, more like theory and uh, and the main uh, as a main overview. But here in the MRP, we start with an MPS, which is the master production schedule. How much do you actually need, or uh, do you plan to to produce? Uh, so then you have a forecast for the sales over a given planning horizon. And then the data sources for determining the MPS will then be, of course, customer orders, what you already have on place, orders from the customers. Of course, they are even more important than, than the forecast. But still, you should have a forecast and uh, hopefully as good as possible forecasting method for the future demand by an item. You also need to know about the safety stock. If you have a variation in the demand, how much should you have as a safety stock to prevent for, for, uncertain, uh, for the uncertainty? Uh, some products will have huge seasonal variation. You should have information about that. And also internal orders from other part of the organization. If you are producing components which you are using uh, in other, uh, other production plant in, this, uh, in the same company or other places in, in, in the same plant. So, <coughs> we should now look at this explosion calculus, uh, which uh, where you should now uh, use this master production schedule, the MPS. Uh, and the MPS will depend on also what we call the bill of material and the bill of material is a specification what do you actually need of smaller components for making one larger component or one sub-assembly of your, your product. So you need to have a bill of material, know exactly what you need, what type of raw materials or components you need and then you can try to make, uh, make this uh, uh, list of uh, uh, exact demand for all the different components you need. So here, explosion calculus is a set of rules for converting the master production schedule, the MPS schedule, to a schedule of requirements for all sub-assemblies. And this can be, well, lots of sub-assemblies. If you have an advanced uh, production company, then uh, you might need uh, lots of, of different components at the, at the smaller levels, and also, of course, raw materials. Uh, but here you have, in basic, two operations in the explosion uh, calculus. One is the time phasing. Uh, how much time do you need for production or eventually ordering the different components? How much is the lead time? You need to know how much time do you need to, to account for when you are uh, planning the different uh, components and sub-assemblies, and also the multiplication if you need more than one per item. So here, in, in basic, you have two operations. One is the time phasing, and the other is the multiplicative uh, factor. So let's now first look at this product structure diagram, because here we have a graphical representation of the relationship between the various levels of the productive system, and it will incorporate for all the information necessary to implement the explosion calculus. Uh, so we will look at one simple example here first, which is a typical product structure diagram, and here you have the end item, what you actually are producing. And this end item will consist of two different sub-assemblies. To make one item, you need actually two sub-assemblies of number A and one of number B. So you have to put two A's and one B together to make one end item. And each sub-assembly A needs one week to produce, while each sub-assembly B needs two weeks to produce. And in addition, these sub-assemblies sub will consist of co uh, components at a lower level. For, so to make one A, you actually need 
one C and two Ds. And they will also have a given uh, time, two weeks and one week of production time or, or lead time if they are uh, delivered from an external vendor. And similar, sub-assembly B will consist of two component Cs and three component Es. Each of them will need two week to produce. So here we know that we, if we, in, we have an order of one it end item in a given period, we need to start planning first for the sub-assemblies. This one needs to start uh, planning two weeks in advance. And for the sub-assemblies, you also need to plan with the components. So this needs to start plan two weeks before we need this one, which needs to be planned two weeks before this one. So here, to make one end item, we need to find the maximum number of weeks in any of this direction. And in this case, two plus two, so we need to start planning four weeks before we need the end item for this particular uh, product. Uh, <coughs> of course, also in addition, if we want one end item, we need to include the number of, uh, uh, of components. Uh, and here we can see that C is actually included in both sub-assembly A and B. So for making one end item, we need one B, which consists of three E's, and one B, which consists of two C's. And we can also see here uh, that the uh, uh, component C will be on this part of the, uh, of the structure, so we need two A's and one C's, so also here we need two C's for one end item, which means that we in total need four component C to make the end item here. And two multiplied by two, we need four of component D, and we need three of component E to make, make one, uh, one uh, sub-assembly, or uh, one assembly or one end item of this particular product. Uh, so, uh, I will also go through one example from the textbook, which uh, will look at one particular product, product which looks like this. A trumpet, which has different components. We have the, well, the bell assembly, which is the main part of the trumpet here. And we also have these valves, and the, in together this is called the valve casing assembly, which consists of the actual case and also the valves. And for one, product, uh, one end item of the trumpet, we need actually three of each of these valves. We take a break and we'll continue on this example in 15 minutes.